I want to share some thoughts with you this evening um, that are just purely my thoughts. They're not facts, they're not um, a belief system that I'm wanting you to take on. They're me talking to you as a herbal colleague. If the stuff that I bring up and, and talk about that you really don't like, um, and with luck I'm going to do that, use that as an opportunity to come to your own conclusions about the issue. Because the issues that I bring up, I think you're all going to agree are real issues. My response, interpretation and deconstruction of those issues um, is going to be very influenced by my anarchist past, my anarchist present, um, <laughs> my aging hippiness, and a complete profound commitment to opposing the patriarchy, to opposing fascism, and a commitment to the alleviation of suffering. So within the context of that, There's some things I want to share with you. So, it's just let me explain the title Rhizomatoy to Radical. Um, this is a, an English version of the Greek letters, which I can never remember. I once <coughs> knew them. The Rhizomatoy, I always get that wrong, Rhizotomoi, sorry, were the Greek equivalent of us. You know the expression the Greeks had a word for it. They usually had multiple words for it. And there were various different types of herbalists in classical Greece. There were the people who were just the gardeners, the people who did the work. And I, I didn't mean that to sound like I'm putting down gardeners. I mean, in, in their hierarchy, they, they were just the worker herbalists. And I've forgotten what the word is for them. At the other extreme, there were the physicians, um, either Hi the Hippocratic physicians or the ones before him, um, who were using herbs, but they were very much like the equivalent of modern MDs who used prescription medications um, but wouldn't know how to make them, uh, wouldn't know how to tell the difference between two different white tablets until you see what sort of person dies from them. Um, <laughs> So we, we have the, the highly trained professional clinician, um, the laborers, and various stages in between, but the core one that relates to us were what in modern terms are, are called the root diggers. Now, that, that's a real put down. That's not what they were. They were people who knew the plants, knew where they grew, knew how to cultivate them, knew how to collect them appropriately, knew how to make the medicine, but then also knew how to use the medicine in the context of people's needs. Um, not to the same degree of um, intellectualizing that the MD equivalents would do, but they got results. They were herbalists. So in a Greek context, we're rhizotomoi. And, excuse me, just need some water. We can follow through um, in the history of, of European culture and American culture the way in which these sorts of people developed and transformed and actually became our sort of people. And I think it's one of the reasons why our culture has such a hard time coping with herbalists is that one of the many reasons they have a hard time coping with herbalists is that we bridge so many realms, we bridge so many worlds, and when we're on, on a good day, we bridge those worlds really well. And let's acknowledge we all have bad days, but on the good days, we are, as a movement, as a field, characterized by, by synergy, characterized by cooperation between plants and humans, between practitioners and their patients, between bottles of tincture and dispensing tubes. We're, we're making links. And again, one of the characteristics of these people and us is that we are not the healers. 
Um, no herbalist, I would suggest, should actually consider themselves to be a healer. It's the plants that are the healers. And in their incredible compassion, they've invited us to be in a dance with them so that we, people who choose to be the herbalists, can actually be the interface between the healing plant and the person who needs that healing plant. But let's be clear, you know, we're, we're just facilitators. So I would like to suggest that there is a modern word that would, we could use instead of this, this Greek one um, that has got lots of implications that I'm going to carry on with. The word radical. Now, I always have to look this one up because there are different ways of spelling radical. This is the botanical way of spelling radical. And the radical is the growing root tip of um, a bean sprout, the, the growing um, basal cap of the root, which is one of the strongest forces in nature. Without the botanical radicals, soil wouldn't work properly. It wouldn't be aerated. It, there, there wouldn't really be life in the soil. It's the radical of the, the growing plants which are turning the soil and allowing stuff to happen. If you've ever seen a, an oak tree or any tree going, growing through a boulder which is cracked in half, I'm sure you've all seen this, it's not growing through a cracked in half boulder. It cracked the boulder in half and it was in the way so it came through. Have you ever seen um, shepherd's purse or something equivalent, breaking a sidewalk. Yeah. Um, it didn't grow in the crack, it produced the crack from underneath. Very quiet, very low key, um, not on the surface very radical, but if we weren't spraying the sidewalks all the time, um, it would just take a few years for things as simple and as profound as um, the shepherd's purse, to completely recycle the concrete. And I would suggest as, as therapists, as a therapy movement, we're actually part of the recycling of the human concrete because we've all been paved over. <laughs> so I can now consider myself to be this sort of radical. The rest of my life I consider myself to be the other sort of radical. Um, but they beat up the other sorts of radicals, so it's a bit safer to be one of these. <laughs> My point is that as therapists, as people involved in, in the healing work, um, that's not value-free. No therapeutic endeavor can possibly be value-free. It's just we pretend it can be. You know, we're, we're either just treating the hemorrhoid or, or dispensing something. Actually, any time that you're involved in um, the transformative work of real healing, facilitating the plants doing the real healing, we're involved in a very profoundly radical transformation of the human soil, involved in a profound marriage between the plants and humans and everything else. Actually working at the interface, which is the evidence of the fact that we are all one. Um, herbalism is ecology and practice, and I'll get into that more in a minute. So any time you give anybody herbs, any time you take herbs, any time you talk to people about herbs, you're being profoundly radical, profoundly transformative, profoundly irritating to the dominant paradigm. And this is my concern. Um, if we look at our history as a movement, we've been suppressed many times, um, oppressed and suppressed. If we could go back far enough, there's a history of the witch burnings. Most of the witches that were burnt were actually healers that were burnt. Uh, one of the bits of evidence that the church used to demonstrate um, being in some relationship with the devil, was that if somebody, if a woman, because women were not allowed education, if a woman was able to heal somebody and they didn't have the right training, because they couldn't have the right training because they couldn't read, um, 
The only way they could do that would be because the devil was doing the work for them. So if you were healing with herbs and you weren't given permission by the power elite, if you weren't a doctor, just the fact of healing somebody with herbs, the, if you were in the wrong century, in the wrong town, you were going to get burnt for it. Now, it's not that bad anymore. Um, it just takes a very different form. Now, we're in a time where the overt oppression of herbalism is not in play anymore. I'm, I'm not wanting to get you paranoid about the FDA. That's, those issues aren't real. What is real, though, is a completely devious co-opting of our ideas, of our vision, but more importantly, of the herbs. In the process of coming from the ancient Greeks to us today, we could go through, and I, I won't go through it in detail, but we could go through an incredibly profoundly rich um, tradition of different sorts of herbalism, different sorts of herbalists. And if you look at the history of, of herbalism, it's, it's just incredibly abundant with really weird characters. Um, one thing it brings home to me is that we're not unusual. Um, herbalists have always been strange. <laughs> Which, I, for me, is a really wonderful strength. If our sort of healing, our ecological healing, which is really an expression of the soil and Gaia working through us, if that was easily accepted by the mainstream culture, something would either have profoundly changed in the mainstream culture or we'd gone really wrong in our herbalism. Because we're a place where what I'm going to call the green can actually express itself. It's, we're a place in the human family where um, what Hildegard of Bingen called Beriditas can come into play. Let me just explain this word. Have you all heard of Hildegard? Yeah. That's a wrong way. Of, have any, anybody here not heard of Hildegard? All right. She, well, actually, how can you explain Hildegard? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. She was 11th, 12th century abbotess in um, a town called Bingen in southern Germany. Um, she was a politician. She was a mystic. She was a composer. Incredible artist. She was also a herbalist. And actually, if you read the writing, she was one of the first places in the European herbal tradition that actually mentions milk thistle. Um, and if you all know the story about, and I never know whether this story is true, the story about the little boy eating the mushrooms and his mother took him to the hospital. Do you know? Well, maybe I'm entirely making that story up there. Sounds like a good story. Yeah, no, 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 it's not. <laughs> but those of you that do know that story, that story is based very close to Bingham. And I've always wondered if, the, if you know, this really is a, a southern German tradition that she was, she was part of. But in her healing work, she was trying to explain what she thought was going on. So in her writings about the actual therapy, it was very much influenced by the, the humoral system of the day. But to explain to her readers what was behind the healing, po pro healing possibilities of plants, she used this word, veriditas, which she made up. And one of the things about herbalists and herbalism over the years is that we end up talking about things the mainstream culture doesn't have words for. So herbalists are always making up new words. You won't find this in a Latin dictionary. You'll find it in the Encyclopedia Catholica, actually. It implies the healing power of the divine in green things that there is something <coughs> profoundly uplifting, transformative, healing, you know, all those words, um, that is just a birthright of having a relationship with the green world. And no animals will be here without the green world. You know, the line, all of life is grass. It's very literally true. Without photosynthesis, we wouldn't be here. So. Our culture has educated us and manipulated us 
into being users and abusers of the green, users of the planet. The world is a resource. Um, we think of plants in fields, forests as you know, resources, resource crops. That has been a very successful way of manipulating us away from the inner experience and the inner flash, the inner insight that actually we're all the same family. Actually, there is no separation between me and my lettuce salad. The only, you know, one happens to be outside initially. It's going to end up inside. But the real nature of the relationship is that the biochemistry of the plant is my biochemistry. We are all one. So in going, actually, we don't need this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> in going through that history, we could find all sorts of varieties of ways of being a herbalist, ways of talking about herbalism, ways of coming up with um, different explanatory theories. And actually, maybe I should give you my definition of a herbalist, um, because on one level, I would suggest there's nothing special about being a herbalist. Um, Firstly, a herb, to me, I'm not going to use the botanical definition, which is a non-woody plant. The ecological definition is a plant lower than 12 inches high. There are all these different definitions of what herbs are. To me, they're any plant. Um, herbalism is... No, actually, I missed a bit. A herbalist is somebody who is in a relationship with a plant, with a herb. And by definition, that means that every human being is a herbalist because we're all in relationship with plants. And actually, anybody who's ever made a cup of tea from a tea bag, herbal medicine makers, they've made infusions. If you've made coffee from coffee beans, you've done decoctions. You know, we, we can get very clever about it and use lots of clever words, but one of the things I think we need to do is, is rebuild the bridges between us specialist herbalists and the people who have had their herbal birthright taken away by a um, hundred years of medical capitalism. So, if we're all herbalists, herbalism, I would suggest, is the conscious exploration of the relationship with the plants. So not everybody is really exploring herbalism. And you can explore herbalism in lots of different ways. I choose to be a clinician. Um, definitely not a grower. I'm, I'm one of the few people I know who can kill dandelion by trying to grow it. <laughs> not my strong point. My real, my real insight here is that there is no correct way to be a herbalist. And there is no correct belief system around herbalism. There are a number of really funky, bad belief systems, but that doesn't mean if you're not in one of the bad ones, you're in the right one. So one of the gifts we have at the moment with the recreation of North American herbalism, which has been going on you know, for 30, 40 years now, um, is that we can create our herbalism in any way, shape, or form we like, as long as it works. It's this instant feedback. You know, we, we can come up with all sorts of theories, but if the person doesn't get better, or if you kill them, or, you know, something's not right. So I want to go through some of the issues that um, I think we have to daily, weekly, regularly reassess for ourselves so that we can be sure that our recreation of herbalism is actually herbalism coming back into play and not another phase of the, um, the defanging of us. Um, we have to be careful not to use the language which is coming from um, belief systems which deny veriditas. So,
let's just talk about some of the historical points that I, I want to use as, as markers here. Um, you've probably all heard of Dioscorides. Um, has a reputation as being the father of herbalism. Have you, have you heard that? He did write a really good book. However, Dioscorides was a military doctor. And the reason he wrote De Materia Medica, which is the, the main book, um, the core reason for that was so that other military doctors would know what herbs to pick and how to use them when they were off with the armies killing people. <laughs> so I personally, consciously, actively refuse to have Dioscorides as the founding father of my movement. Do you get my point? Um, you know, we're healers or, or what? This is no denying of the contribution that Dioscorides made. Really, really, really important stuff. But when a military doctor is put up as a role model, we're being manipulated. And there's a lot, long history of this manipulation. Um, you may have heard of Dr. Withering, um, the man who, quote, discovered foxglove, unquote. Um, the first page of his book on the foxglove, which I actually really recommend you read, it's an excellent book. Again, this is no put down of him and his work. It's a deconstruction of how he and his work have been used to put us in our place. And the, first page of the book where he describes observing um, people getting better with dropsy when they were using this mixture, the mixture came from, quote, a village wise woman. End of story. We don't know who she was. She's never mentioned anywhere else in the book. Withering becomes the discoverer of foxglove. And the whole of the history of the medical world taking on medicinal plants, not the whole of it, 90% of it is the elite using insights which come from the people, come from the general knowledge of the country folk who didn't write stuff down. Not only did they not write stuff down, the women wouldn't have known how to write anyway. That wasn't their fault, it was the patriarchy not allowing them to, to learn those skills. So we have a, a hidden secret history that we're never really going to know about. If you look at the, the history of medicine, history of pharmacy books, it's a history of men, history usually of rich men, and usually of rich men who don't rock the boat. So let me give you an example of one who did rock the boat and what happened to him. Um, you've all heard of Nicholas Culpepper. Um, have any of you ever tried to read the book? <laughs> I gave up. Yeah. So, the, no comment on the book. Um, he wrote the book, though, so that he could provide the English public, the people who could read in those days, the information which up until then had been only in Latin. And not just in Latin, in a strange form of Latin called pharmaceutical Latin. Um, and the only reason is pharmaceutical Latin as opposed to scientific Latin and, and church Latin is that all the various um, professional groups are trying to keep secrets from each other. So he wrote the book at a time when the whole of English culture was going through a profound change. Um, what over here you call the English Civil War. Now, if you actually know the history of it, it wasn't a civil war, it was a people's revolution. And unfortunately, there were three sides, so, but we, we won't go into that. What was happening was that there was a groundswell of revolutionary consciousness amongst the people. It took all sorts of weird, crazy forms, but one of those forms was somebody in the professional elite saying, screw this, the people need the knowledge. The people need it back. So he wrote the book in English, and then his store was burned down two or three times, and really messy, messy history. The implication of that for me is that every time Western culture goes through one of its regular reassertions of, of the human spirit, herbalism comes back 
as, um, as part of the social issues of the day. I can give you lots of other examples of this, but I won't. I'll just stick to one or two. You, I'm, a, I'm a fellow of the British National Institute of Medical Herbalists. It was formed in 1864, give or take, actually initiated by some Americans. Um, it, they, they were the beginning of the wave of people who were trying to get away from what was going on over here and wh what turned into the, eventually into the Flexner Report and all, all of that stuff. But the Institute was formed at a time when in, in Britain there was something called the Chartist Movement. It was a time when, again, the people were demanding a voice. They were demanding the vote. And of course, they didn't really get it. You know, the, the oppression carried on. A major, major... Um, oh, it just got messy. The point was that there was a social, cultural demand and openness to herbalism again. The latest manifestation of this particular pattern, um, I would suggest, is what we now call the Herb Renaissance. And if you follow that back, that's really the Flower Power Renaissance. Now, there are little pockets of herbalism that su survived, um, not consumption of herbalism, but actually use and understanding and, and knowledge about the use of herbs. Um, there were pockets of it that survived in various cultural groups around the country. But it's no coincidence that the late 60s transformation was characterized by this thing called flower power. Some of us got the flower part of that. <laughs> and we can follow a whole range, well, I won't, won't mention names. There's a, most of the teachers that you know who are <laughs> over a certain age um, started their herbalism um, when they were either doing sit-ins or exploring some specific herbs. <laughs> but what happened in that very transformative space of the late 60s, early 70s, some of us actually got touched by the herbs. Something happened which enabled the green, whatever words you want to use, to touch us inside, which changed lives all over the place. Um, so a whole bunch of people then dedicated themselves to exploring herbalism. And there were no schools. There were hardly any books. And it was really down to doing it ourselves, going into the woods and exploring, and finding out you know, which ones you don't want to drink, which ones you do. Um, the time of people being free. And for me, the characteristic of herbalism is that it's the medicine of freedom. Herbs are the people's medicine. You don't need to get a prescription to get the sun to shine to help the soil to grow the seeds or the plants there. Um, I'll get onto the herb industry in a minute. It's a different thing. And, and coming from England, I can very easily see the difference between the herb industry and the herb movement. Hardly anybody that I talk to over here initially sees them as being separate things. Um, because for most people today, the, their introduction to herbalism is the, the flyers that go with the product on the store shelves. And they're usually good flyers, so there's usually going to be a bit of knowledge there. However, that is a com com complete commodification of a profoundly spiritual relationship. You can't bottle Beriditas up and put it in, in capsules. You definitely can't freeze dry Veriditas. 